Hey, this is a video summary of our week 8 lecture in Nutrition, Exercise, Metabolism, KIN 3030 at the University of Gulf Humber. Uh, this week we're looking at how different training paradigms can maximize energy expenditure. We've talked about this idea that the development of insulin resistance is a balance between food intake and energy expenditure. When you eat more food, uh, eat more calories than you expend, that tends to increase your risk for insulin resistance. And the reverse is true. We've seen that a decrease in food intake can help us reduce insulin resistance. And now we're moving to the other end of the spectrum. We're looking to see whether or not exercise can tip the balance um, in the other direction. So what exercise will give us the most energy expenditure to tip this balance most effectively? Um, so the question that we're asking is which exercise is best? There's a couple different uh, options. Actually, there are a lot of different options out there. I've categorized them into three main categories. You can see two of them at the top here. Moderate intensity training, high intensity training, uh, specifically high intensity interval training. And the other one that's not listed here is sprint interval training. So really, uh, really intense 30 second all out bouts of exercise. And we typically call these Wingate tests. Now, some of the most important things to consider I've listed on the left. First of all, you want to know what the adaptation will be that you get from whatever type of training. Will one type get me more trained than another? Because that might affect whether or not you want to partake in that training. A second one is intensity. Uh, if something is too intense, you might not stick with it. Time requirement is a big one as well. Can you fit uh, the required volume of exercise into your weekly schedule? And lastly, what we're going to focus on in the papers this week is energy expenditure. Which type of exercise gives us the largest energy expenditure to help us get rid of the excess fuel that we're storing in our bodies when we're overweight, obese, or insulin resistant? All of these things combine to result in compliance. There's not going to be one right answer for, uh, for every person, but each person will have to dictate, based on their personal preferences, which type of exercise is best for them. How much time do you have? How hard can you push yourself? Um, how much do you want to work on a weekly basis? So the three categories that I've kind of outlined, uh, you can visualize on this slide. Moderate intensity training or endurance training looks something like this, where you have a relatively low workload that you maintain for one to two hours just at a constant pace, just kind of get in the zone and you forget about it. Whereas high intensity intervals are a higher intensity. Overall, you spend less time exercising, less total time doing whatever the exercise is. And typically these are four to five minute intervals um, with one to two minutes off in between. Working, at, working for less time allows you to work at a higher intensity. And so maybe that will confer benefit as far as adaptation. And then at the end of the spectrum is sprint interval training. You can see here really, really high exercise intensity, much shorter exercise duration. In total, you might be exercising for 20 to 40 minutes. Each of these bars is 30 seconds long, and then the break in between is about four minutes. So drastically different styles of exercise. And we wanna see if one of these is better uh, than the others for increasing the adaptation to training and for using energy. So let's start looking at those ideas in order. First of all, the adaptation. If we talk just about the muscle, how well can the muscle adapt to be able to do work? Um, this slide essentially shows that all three types of training, in the top left you can see sprint interval training, endurance training, and then in the bottom right you can see high intensity interval training even though it's not listed. All three of these types of training increase mitochondrial enzyme activity in as little as two weeks. And the increases are all uh, similar. So one's not better than the others. Now we use mitochondrial enzyme activity as a marker for oxidative capacity. Uh, you can also use it as a marker for mitochondrial volume. Basically this tells you how much energy can you produce aerobically? What's your aerobic capacity? So the top left, you can see cytochrome oxidase activity 
in sprint and endurance training, similar increases in both groups with training. Um, cytochrome oxidase is a protein in the electron transport chain. And in the bottom right, you can see beta HAD, the protein in beta oxidation, and citrate synthase, a protein in the TCA cycle. They both have similar increases around 20-25% uh, after high intensity interval training. So as far as adaptation at the muscle goes, pretty much a mixed bag so far. One is not better than the other as far as we can tell. Now, muscle adaptation doesn't tell the whole story. How does the muscle function? It seems that all three types of exercise are just as effective at increasing, increasing fat oxidation after training. So on the left, you can see the comparison of sprint interval to endurance training again. And the, on the right is high intensity intervals. And this is data that's taken from just a one hour moderate intensity exercise about around 65% of VO2 max. And you can see that fat oxidation in each case is increased after training. And they're increased to a similar amount. Now this is really interesting because when you're doing definitely sprint interval training and to a lesser extent high intensity intervals, you might be relying less on the aerobic system. When you're doing this type of training, you're practicing your anaerobic uh, ATP production. You're practicing um, doing sprint exercise, which isn't really aerobic, and you don't have to burn a lot of fat to do that. And so it's interesting to see that even after that type of exercise, the muscle has adapted to be able to use fat when you move to a moderate intensity type of exercise. So similar adaptations at the muscle as far as oxidative capacity, and that's, that results in a functional adaptation that's similar in all three groups. All three groups can increase fat oxidation after training. Now, what about what these do for the body. My muscle can use more oxygen to make ATP. My muscle can use more fat. What does that do to me, to my body as a whole? Um, there's only one study that really compares different types of exercise in this respect. And it only compares moderate intensity to high intensity interval training. It doesn't really talk about sprint interval training. But this looks at um, the accumulation of subcutaneous fat before and after moderate and high intensity interval training programs. And you can see what the weekly um, prescription for each one was at the top right. Now, the main thing that you'll notice from this study is that the sum of six skin folds decreased more after high intensity interval training versus moderate intensity training. So skin fold is just measured using a caliper that pinches the skin and measures the thickness of the skin. The thickness of the skin will be dictated by how much fat is there. And so they've done that six times around the body, added all those uh, skin folds up, and the bars here are the decrease in the sum of six skin folds before and after, or sorry, the decrease in the sum of six skin folds after endurance training and high intensity training. So on the far left, you can see that the black bars, the high intensity training group, uh, had a much larger decrease in the sum of six skin folds, which means a larger decrease in subcutaneous fat than the endurance training group. So we see a larger decrease, and this is particularly striking because they exercised less. The high intensity interval group had only 15 weeks of exercise training versus 20 weeks in the moderate intensity group. And overall, they performed less exercise. Their exercise volume was lower. So when you correct the change in sum of skin folds, you can see back on the left, there was a greater change per megajoule of exercise done. So something about this exercise seems to be using up more of your body's fuel stores than moderate intensity exercise for some reason. Now, what about energy expenditure? We can actually calculate what the aerobic energy expenditure is during exercise for at least moderate intensity and high intensity interval training. We know that 
when you use or consume one liter of oxygen while exercising, that roughly equates to about five kcals of energy that you burn. So if we take a subject that hypothetically has a VO2 max of three liters per minute and 225 watts, if they did a moderate intensity training program, or just one moderate intensity session, this is one to two hours at 50 to 70% of VO2 max, then that person will have used 450 to 1,260 kcals of energy to, to do that exercise. So this is aerobic energy expenditure during moderate intensity training. If you compare that to high intensity interval training, 20 to 40 minutes of actual exercise, 80 to 90% of VO2 max. If you do the calculations here, energy expended is only 240 to 540 kcals. Now this is important, an important distinction to make. This is only aerobic energy expenditure there's no way to really approximate the amount of anaerobic energy that was used to accomplish this exercise. And that's why we can't really approximate the energy expenditure during sprint exercise because so much of it comes from the anaerobic systems. So this is probably an underestimate on the right hand side in the high intensity interval training group. The other reason why it's probably an underestimate is that this is just a measure of the kcals expended during exercise. Remember, there's breaks in between the sprints, and you're probably still consuming energy in the breaks between sprints in order to pump ions, possibly even resynthesize glycogen. Um, so this will be definitely an underestimate of the total amount of energy used, but still, you can see that as a whole, moderate intensity used more energy than high intensity interval training. Overall, there seems to be a trade-off where with high intensity interval training and with sprint interval training, you exercise for less time and it seems as though you're expending less energy in every single exercise bout. So bittersweet message as far as interval training and sprint training go. Now this summary table lists all the major characteristics of all the, or the three main types of exercise that we're talking about in this summary. So you can see what typically I mean when I refer to endurance training on the left, high intensity interval training in the middle, and sprint interval training on the right. In the second row down, the training volume row, you can see an approximation of how much work has to be done for each of these paradigms every uh, session and every week. You can see that decreases drastically as you move from endurance training all the way to sprint training. You're doing a tenth of the work, essentially, in sprint interval training that you're doing in endurance training every session and every week. All of them are equally effective in getting you trained. Two weeks seem to be roughly what you need in order to get to a, a physical fit uh, kind of level. And then as far as energy expenditure goes, we calculated that endurance training uses the most energy during exercise. High intensity intervals uh, use less energy during exercise. And then we don't know what happens really with sprint interval training yet. But the, the thing that really sticks in my mind and probably in your minds is why did we see such a decrease in the sum of skin folds if we're using less energy in high intensity interval training? Why would that target subcutaneous fat? Why would that energy depot decrease more in an exercise that doesn't use as much energy every session and every week? So there's a disconnect here. And what we think is happening is that energy expenditure goes up in recovery after high intensity intervals and after sprint intervals to kind of make up for the difference that there is between energy expended in each of the sessions. So this is what we're looking at this week. EPOC, exercise, or excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. EPOC increases with intensity and it increases with duration. And it represents energy that you have to spend in recovery from exercise to get back to normal. So the greater the disturbance of exercise, the more energy it takes to get back to normal. And so you can see on the left that as we approach 
in this graph a peak of 80% of VO2 max, we see large increases in EPOC. And that's right around where we do high intensity interval training. But what about sprint interval training? What happens when we go above 80 to 100% of VO2 max? Does this slope continue to go up? Do we get massive increases in EPOC? Because that could really help use a lot more energy um, and help equal out the balance between energy expenditure and moderate intensity exercise and sprint interval exercise. Another thing to take into account is there seems to be a threshold at about 50% VO2 max where if you're exercising below this threshold, EPOC doesn't really respond. But as soon as you cross this threshold, you start to see progressive increases in EPOC. So something to keep in mind if you want to reap the benefits of using energy in recovery from exercise for yourself or if you're prescribing exercise to a client. So the papers that we're looking at this week are just to see first in paper A, is EPOC different between high intensity interval running and endurance running? So do you use more energy in recovery from a more intense exercise? Next, in paper B, we want to see, is fat oxidation specifically different? So maybe you're using more energy, but are you using more fat in recovery from high-intensity interval cycling versus endurance cycling? That might help explain the difference in the skinfold data that we saw. And last, we want to get a little bit of sprint interval training in there. Without matching work and worrying about that stuff, what happens to EPOC over the course of an entire day in response to just one session of sprint interval training versus one session of endurance training.